Welcome to this tutorial on the one-way analysis of variance, or the ANOVA. This is Dr. Amanda Rockinson zabq During our time together, we are going to look at the definition of the ANOVA, um, when we can use the ANOVA, and examples of when a researcher may use the ANOVA. We're also going to talk about calculating the ANOVA, starting with assumption testing, moving on to the F ratio, the, then to the pairwise comparisons, and then the effect size. And finally, we'll end by um, discussing how to report an ANOVA in an APA results section, or the um, results of an ANOVA in an APA results section, and also look at how to set up an SPSS data file. So let's get started. So let's start by defining the analysis of variance. An analysis of variance, or an ANOVA, is used to test the hypotheses about differences between multiple means, or the differences between multiple groups. Let's say for an example, an educator wants to collect data on the learning outcomes of students enrolled in three different types of course, courses, um, a blended course, an online course, and a residential course. And the researcher wants to compare the mean scores of these three different groups, or more specifically if the course points of, um, differ based on the type of course that a student takes. Now, while the um, ANOVA hypothesizes that there is a difference between the means of these groups, um, in this case we're looking at three groups, but when we use an ANOVA it can really be three or more groups, so we can have four groups, five groups, six groups, but in this tutorial we're really going to focus on three groups just for the sake of simplicity. So while an ANOVA hypothesizes that there is a difference between the means of groups, it actually looks at the variation between the groups rather than examining the sample and um, population means as values in hypothesis testing as we've done in the past um, looking at t-test. So the analysis of variance actually examines the variance in order to come to the conclusion if a statistically significant difference exists between groups. Now before we move on it's important to talk about why not do multiple t-tests here. Remember a t-test, which is based on the standard error of the difference between the two means, can be used to test the differences when you have two groups and, or two means. So when there are more than two means, it is actually possible um, to compare the means with each other mean using multiple t-tests. However, an ANOVA is more robust because conducting multiple t-tests can actually lead to a severe inflation of a type 1 error rate. And an ANOVA can be used to test the difference among, differences among several group means or among several means without increasing the type one, um, type 1 error rate. So a one-way ANOVA is the best choice to compare the mean scores of three or more groups. So based on this, for a one-way ANOVA, the researcher needs to have two types of variables. First, a um, categorical independent variable with three or more distinct groups. For example, the type of course format or the type of course um, online, blended, and residential. The researcher also needs to have one continuous dependent variable. That's a dependent variable that's measured at the um, ratio or interval level. This could be a community score, um, it could be a, um, it could also be something such as course points. Here remember that in educational research and social science research oftentimes Likert scale data such as a community scale is treated as interval ratio um, data. So here a continuous dependent variable could be a sense of community score. So now that we have a basic understanding of what a one-way ANOVA is, as well as um, when it can be used, let's take a look at an example of when a researcher may use a one-way ANOVA. If you've listened to the independent samples t-test tutorial, this should sound familiar. Um, consider a study in which an educational researcher decides to conduct an experiment um, by applying media richness theory to his online class. Now, media richness theory is based on the assumption that the use of rich media as compared to lean media results in more effective communication. So the more rich the media, the more effective the communication. Um, and media richness can really be thought of in terms of 
more face-to-face like communication um, the more clear the message is so considering this using video conferencing in an online course for communication purposes is more media rich than an asynchronous com- asynchronous communication media such as discussion board and video conferencing um, for communication in online class is also more media rich than let's say au- simply using audio conferencing so this implies that video conferencing when compared to both discussion boards and audio conferencing may be more effective um, in terms of communication in the online environment and because communication is better the message may be clearer better learning may occur so the researcher um, decides to randomly assign a group of graduate students taking a statistics course to one of three groups he puts one in um, he puts some of his students in the discussion board group so they're going to use discussion board to communicate online during the course he puts another um, sample or subsample in the audio conferencing group they're going to use let's say something like a Skype um, with only audio over the internet to communicate during the course and then finally he um, has a video conferencing group so um, And just um, for the sake of good research design, the groups um, cover the same material, they have the same assignments, and they have similar demographics. And he wants to look at um, the learning outcome of these three groups or compare these three groups based on the learning outcome. So the dependent variable or learning outcome is actually course points ranging from zero to a thousand. As a result, this is the question that he poses um, and is appropriate for a one-way ANOVA. The question is, is there a statistically significant difference in graduate students' course points based on the type of communication medium um, used in their online course, whether it be video conferencing, audio conferencing, or discussion board? The corresponding hypothesis then is, is there is no statistically significant difference in the graduate students course points based on the type of communication medium that they're using for their online courses. Because the educational researcher is comparing three samples or three subsamples and um, on one dependent variable course points the correct hypothesis for testing procedure in this case is a one-way um, ANOVA so to differentiate between when one would use an independent samples t-test versus a one-way ANOVA we look at this diagram when there's two groups an independent samples t-test is most likely the best choice of analysis however when there's more than two groups then the best choice is probably a one-way ANOVA I will however note here that sometimes an independent t-test is not the most robust test in fact there's a great article called the good the bad and the ugly of the t-test so even sometimes when you have just two groups that you're comparing you may want to consider a one-way ANOVA but for the most part if you have two groups if you're comparing two groups on one dependent variable you're going to use an independent samples t-test if you're comparing three or more groups Um, on one dependent variable you're going to use a one-way ANOVA so as I said different from the t-test the ANOVA examines the variance in order to come to the conclusion about group differences so the null hypothesis states that there's no difference between the means of any groups however this means that the amount of variance due to the different treatment effects is roughly equal to the amount of variance that would normally occur by chance alternatively the research hypothesis states that there will be a difference or that there are there is a difference between the means so here is what I want you to understand even though the null hypothesis states that there's no difference between the means really what we're looking at is the variance so understanding variance is really important in understanding the one-way ANOVA and we're going to spend a few minutes talking about this in the ANOVA there are two types of variance that we want to be aware of the variance within each group that is the variance that occurs within each sample and the variance between the groups here we're interested in really the between group variance as the indicator of difference between the three different groups or multiple groups that we're looking at the analysis of variance or the ANOVA compares the two types of variance to each other and if the between group variance is greater 
than the within group variance, we can see a st um, statistically significant difference between the groups more clearly. Let's talk about this further. The within groups estimate of the population variance, or within group variance for short, is the average of the normal variance estimates of all three groups. The variance for each group is found separately, and then these variances are simply averaged together. Whereas the between groups variance, or the between groups estimate of the population variance, is the variance that occurs between the groups. It takes into account the scores across all the groups and uses the means of each group as well as the overall grand mean to estimate the population variance. Now, the grand mean may be a new term for you. It simply means the mean of all the means of the subsamples or groups. So, let's talk about this diagram here. First, we find the means of all three groups and the grand mean, the mean of all the scores. Then we use um, these means to construct a distribution of sample means and find the variance of that distribution, the estimated variance of the distribution mean. Finally, to find the between groups variance, we simply multiply the variance of the distribution of the means by the sample size. Now, these two types of variance, that is the ratio of the between groups variance to the within groups variance, creates what is called the F ratio, which really is what is our end game in the one-way ANOVA. It takes numerous calculations, however, to find this F ratio. However, it's important for us to walk through the process so we can understand exactly how this test works and the concepts behind it. Then. When you go to perform a one-way ANOVA using SPSS and it does the steps for you, you'll be able to interpret the results and write about them in a more knowledgeable manner. It's also important here to note that the F ratio is only the first part of the one-way ANOVA. The Onibus F, meaning um, it's the Onibus F, meaning that it's um, an overall indicator of some difference between the, the population means. So the F ratio tells us that there's a difference, but it doesn't tell us which groups of the three in our example, or the three or more, may be different from one another. It only, like I said, it only tells us that there is some type of difference. If the results of the Onibus F test are significant, then we need to go a step further and compare each group to each other group, um, two at a time, to determine which group means are significantly different from one another. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. Let's stay focused on the F ratio here for a few more minutes. So let's talk a little bit further about this F ratio and the two variances, and let's talk about it in light of hypothesis testing. I want to summarize what I just said, but I'm also going to introduce you to some new terms um, as I do some summarization. It, um, these terms are what you'll often see in statistical textbooks, so it's important that you know and that you understand them. So to summarize this, it's important to understand that the key statistic in an ANOVA is the F test of difference of the group means, testing if the means of the groups formed by the values of the independent variable are different enough to have not occurred by chance. Basically, the F test does this by comparing the two estimates of variances, or the two types of variances. One estimate is based on the within sample. Um, sometimes this is referred to as the mean square error, or MSE for short. The second is based on the variance between the sample means, and this is referred to as the mean square between, or MSB for short. So the logic by which the analysis of variance tests the null hypothesis is as follows. So if the null hypothesis is true, then MSE and MSB should be about the same since they are both estimates of the same quantity. So if it's true, MSE and MSB should be equal and we fail to reject the null hypothesis. However, if the null hypothesis is false, that is, we reject the null hypothesis, then MSB can expect it um, to be can be expected to be larger than MSE since MSB is estimating that the quantity is larger than the variance. Let's um, 
think about this a little bit further. The hypothesis of test um, hypothesis testing associated with the ANOVA is based on the ratio then of MSB to MSE. If the computed F statistic is greater than one, then there is a more there's more variation um, between the groups than within the groups, from which we can infer that the grouping variable does make the difference. If the S statistic is um, enough above one, it will be found to be significant and the null hypothesis that the population means are equal can be rejected. Let's examine this figure here, um, which shows Hypoth a hypothetical distribution for let's say group A and group B on some interval or ratio scale, some dependent variable. In this example we have only two sample distributions and this is simply for the sake of um, simplicity. Normally we expect to see three or more remember with an ANOVA but the concept um, we will examine remains unchanged and as it turns out actually a t-test is a special case of a one-way ANOVA which only examines two groups. Here the F statistic will be relatively high in this example because of the um, relatively large separation between both sample means, suggesting that they come from different populations. Notice that there is little overlap between the two sample distributions. However, if we reduce the separation between the sample means, we, that is, we reduce the MSB, the overlap will become greater and the F statistic will become smaller. Similarly with um, within group variants or MSE, as MSE gets larger resulting in a flatter wider distribution, there will be more overlap resulting in a smaller F statistic. So now that we have a good understanding of the F ratio and what it is, let's talk about actually calculating that F ratio. Let's begin with looking at a list, um, and this is simply for your reference, of all the ingredients that we're going to need to gather in order to calculate the F ratio and perform the one-way ANOVA. As you can see, there's multiple ingredients that we need, so there's going to be multiple steps to conducting the ANOVA. Prior to conducting an ANOVA, it's important to ensure that the assumptions are met so that we can ensure that the ANOVA is a robust test. Here you see a list of the assumptions that um, need to be met. You'll notice that they're very similar to an independent samples t-test. First of all, there's normality. Normality assumes that the population distributions are normal. You check for normality by creating a histogram or conducting normality tests such as Shapiro or Wilkes or the Smirnoff test. Remember on a histogram for each of the distributions or each of the separate groups you're looking um, to see that normality is assumed by, see, to, by making sure that there's a symmetrical bell curve shape. Um, for the normality test, remember non-significant results, a signi uh, significance level of 0.05 or above indicates tenability of an assumption, that is, that normality can be assumed. So normality is the first assumption. Homogeneity of variance is the second assumption, or equal variance. An equal variance assumes that the population distributions have the same variance. If this assumption is violated, um, the averaging of the two variants is really futile um, in a, in a one-way ANOVA. Um, the next and remember that um, homogeneity of variance is often calculated or um, examined using the Levine's test. And here again, just like the normality test, a significance level larger than 0.05 um, indicates equal variances can be assumed or that the assumption of homogeneity of variance is tenable. Independent scores are important. Scores um, in the sample need to be independent of one another. Each of the groups need to be independent. If they're not, then you need to think about using your repeated measures ANOVA. Also, the sample size. Um, this is more of a practical ma matter, but n of the scores within each group needs to be reasonably large to make sure that you have adequate statistical power. The, that is, the probability of rejecting the null hypothesis when it, the null hypothesis is actually false. Here it's important to um, note, especially with an ANOVA, when the sample sizes are relatively large approximately e and approximately equal in size, so I have, you know, if I have three groups, I have about 10 in each group, let's say, um, 
This test, the ANOVA, is fairly robust to violations against assumptions of normality as well as hom homogeneity of variance. This means that although power is decreased, the probability of a type 1 error is as low or lower than it would be if the assumptions were met. There are exceptions to this rule. For example, a combination of unequal sample sizes or, and a violation of the assumption of homogeneity of variance can lead to an inflated type 1 error rate. So, despite the robustness of an ANOVA to violations of assumptions, it's necessary to go ahead and evaluate all the assumptions and report violations and then note how these violations affect your, um, especially your F ratio. So this is just a summary of the different assumption tests that need to be run prior to conducting the one-way ANOVA. Now it's finally time to look at the steps for conducting a one-way ANOVA, specifically calculating the F ratio. The first tack is, is to find the means and the estimated population variance for each group. The estimated population variance is the value of S squared and is found um, as usual by dividing the sum of the squares by the degrees of freedom, which is equal to N minus 1 for each group. The only difference here um, as compared to the independent samples t-test is that you will calculate a s squared value for each group. So if you have three groups, you will have three of them. Next, take the three s squared values that you computed in step one and average them together. This gives you your within groups variance, also called um, the mean squares within or the notation is ms within. The formula appears here. This value represents the variance that would occur within the groups by chance and not as a result of any of the treatment. This is one of the values that you will use to compute the F ratio. Now that you've found the within groups variance, you are going to look at how to calculate the between groups variance. The first step in finding the between groups variance is to compute what is called the grand mean. Remember, this is simply the mean of all the scores in the study, regardless of the group, and can be calculated by finding the mean of the group means using the formula shown here. Next, use the sample means and the grand mean to estimate the variance of the distribution of the means. This value is represented by the value S squared M, which is the same as the estimated population variance as the distribution means in the independent samples t-test. For the one-way ANOVA, S squared M is found by subtracting the grand mean from each of the sample means, squaring these values, adding them together, and dividing the between groups degrees of freedom. This last value, degrees of freedom between, is the number of groups in your study minus one. So we've been using the example of three groups. Therefore, the degrees of freedom between would equal two, three minus one. We've now come to the point where we can figure our between groups variance, or mean square between, or MS between. To find the between groups variance, you multiply the variance of the distribution of the means from step four by the number of participants in the sample, N. It is important to note here that N does not represent all of the participants across the entire study, or capital N. Rather, it is the number of participants in one group. If each of your groups has five individuals, then n is five, not 15. Um, if each of the groups, let's say, has nine members, then n is nine, and so on. This method only works if the samples um, are the same size. For the sake of time as well, um, I'm not going to go into unequal sample sizes here. However, it is something that you would want to read further about in statistical text. The between groups variance is the value um, that tells us about the amount of variation that is due to the effect of the different uh, treatments, which is really, really what we're interested in um, when we're conducting a one-way ANOVA. So we now have the second value we need in order to compute the F ratio at the end of the analysis. And thus, we are finally ready to calculate the F ratio. F equals the between groups variance divided by the within groups variance. So here you'll divide the value that you found in step 5 by the value that you found in step 2.
So now we have this F ratio, what does it mean? What does it tell us? Well, remember that our null hypothesis states that there's no statistically significant difference between the means of any of our groups. This means that the amount of variance due to the different treatment effects, the between groups variance, is roughly equal to the amount or is equal to the amount of variance that would normally occur by chance, that is, the within group difference. So if this, or sorry, the within groups variance, not the within groups difference, within groups variance. So if this is true, the variance are um, roughly the same, then our F ratio really should be close to 1. Let's take a um, look at it at an example of this. Let's say that our between groups variance equals 20 and our within groups variance equals 18. Um, if we are to divide 20 by 18, then we'd find out that our F ratio is equal to 1.11. Because it's so close to 1, we can assume that there's probably not a large treatment effect in our study and p potentially um, no statistically significant effect. Alternatively, our research hypothesis states that the population means are different. What we specifically are looking for is the F ratio to be greater, actually much greater, much larger than 1. Um, if it is larger than 1, then what this means is, is that the between groups variance is much larger than the within groups variance. From here, we can probably conclude that there is a large portion of variance that's due to the treatment. Um, a difference between groups due to the different treatment conditions. So, for example, we may find that our within groups variance is, let's say, still 18, but our between groups variance is 200. So, if we divide 18 by 200, we find out that our F ratio is actually 11.11. So, it's much larger than 1. Now, how exactly do we determine whether or not this F ratio value is really significant? Well, just like our Z tests and our um, T tests, there's a F table that contains the critical values of F for a one-way ANOVA, and this is found in most statistical texts. Now, when you look at an F table, what you'll probably notice is it's very similar to a T table or a Z table. However, um, there are a few differences that I want to make note of here. Because the F ratio is a ratio of squared values to the squared value, it will always be greater than zero because um, a number squared can never be equal to a negative number. This means that the F distribution starts at zero and that the F table does not contain any negative values. Remember, a T table does. The second important thing to remember here is that you must use two different types of degrees of freedom when you're looking up the critical F value. The first is the between groups degrees of freedom, which um, you remember you computed and is equal to the number of groups minus one. So if we have three groups minus one, that equals two. The second value is the within groups degrees of freedom, or df within, and this is found by adding up the degrees of freedom of all the samples. So for example, let's say you have um, three groups with 10 subjects or 10 participants each, then the degrees of freedom within is equal to 9, so 9 plus 9 plus 9 is equal to 27. You use these degrees of freedom as well as a significance level, usually a 0 .05, to find the critical value so that you can compare your study's F ratio to it. Any F ratio that is greater than the critical F value is significant. In this case, if you're um, able to reject the null hypothesis of no difference between the population means and support the research hypothesis that there is a statistically significant difference. However, if the study is F ratio is smaller than the critical F value from the table, then the null hypothesis cannot be rejected and, there, um, and as the researcher you could conclude that there's no statistically significant difference between the means. So deciding whether or not to reject or fail to reject the null hypothesis is determined by calculating this test statistic and then comparing it to the table or the values in the table. However, when using a statistical software program um, such as SPSS, 
it automatically calculates the ANOVA um, F value for you and SPSS also reports the um, alpha level associated with this statistic. So the alpha can be used to determine whether or not um, the results are statistically significant and whether or not you should reject or fail to reject the null hypothesis. If the reported alpha um, value or alpha level is equal to or less than the a prior significance level set, usually at a 0 0.05, then there's evidence to reject the null hypothesis and conclude that the results were statistically significantly different. However, if the alpha value is more than the a prior significance level, more than 0 0.05, then um, you fail to reject the null hypothesis and conclude that there was no statistically significant difference. So, this concludes our discussion on talking about the F ratio and determining the statistical significance of the ANOVA, we're now going to turn our attention to the second part and that is pairwise comparisons. The F ratio that we just covered then is the first part of the ANOVA analysis. It's often called what um, I've called several times the Onibus F, meaning that it's the overall indicator that some type of difference exists between the means. However, as we've discussed, the F ratio does not tell us which of the three groups are, or more groups, if we're dealing with more than three groups, are different from one another. It really only tells us that there is some type of difference. So, if the results of our Onibus F test are significant, then we need to go a step further and compare each group to each other group to determine where the significant lies. And we do this two at a time specifically to determine which group means are significantly different from each other and which are not. And we do this doing what are called pairwise comparisons. There are two different types of pairwise comparisons that you can use, or two different methods that researchers use to examine the differences between pairs of groups. There's the planned contrast and the post hoc comparisons. From the names, of names alone, you can probably distinguish the differences between these. In um, planned contrast, the researcher um, knows what means they want to compare ahead of time, their plan. Whereas in the post hoc comparisons, the researcher goes hunting for the mean differences after they found a significant F test in the ANOVA. So let's talk about these a little bit further. Let's start with a, pl a planned contrast. The first method is used when a researcher um, has already set up planned contrast before the study. These are usually set up when um, there's some type of theory or previous research results that guide the researcher to look at the difference between specific group means. For example, let's um, talk about the study that we've been, we've been looking at. In the example study where there are two different types of synchronous treatments, video conferencing and audio conferencing, and a control group, the discussion board group, the educational researcher may be especially interested in the difference between the audio and video group. She may expect that both the audio and video group will significantly differ from the discussion board group, but really the interest lies in whether or not the video and audio group differ. So if she begins her study with this idea in mind, and propose, she would propose the question, is there a statistically significant difference in learning outcomes between the audio and video group? And she would propose a corresponding hypothesis. In stating this before the study, she plans to do a comparison between the means of these two specific treatment groups. Now, before we move on to talking about post hoc tests, let me make a note here. Some authors say um, in statistical texts that if the goal is simply doing these planned comparison groups ahead of time, because there is an expected difference based on either theory or research, then maybe the Onibus F test doesn't even need to really be done. Um, they actually specifically say that you don't need to do the F test to see if you can reject the Onibus null hypothesis that all the um, means are equal. You just go ahead and do the planned comparison. However, if you're familiar in with research and reading research, what you often see is that the ANOVA is still done and then the planned or the ANOVA F test is still done, and then the plans comparisons. Now let's take a look at post hoc comparisons. Perhaps um, the, re the educational researcher 
did not plan any comparisons at the beginning of the study because she really didn't have any specific expectations based on previous research or theory. So, and what she finds out is after um, gathering her data that her F value is significant. And so she wishes to explore the data to determine which pairs of groups are significantly different from each other. This type of analysis is called the post hoc comparison. And the reason it's called post hoc is because it occurs after the test is completed. Again, it's not based on any theory or any research. It's more based like on curiosity of, as far as which groups are actually different from which, each other and which aren't. If a researcher does not plan um, the contrast, then she will look at the differences between the groups using post hoc comparisons. The main thing, one of the main things to keep in mind here is that there are multiple different post hoc comparison tests that can be used. And you probably are familiar with some of them. Fisher's um, LSD, Tukey's, Chef-A's test, there's a number of them. And there's different reasons you would choose different ones based on your data. I'm not going to go into depth about each different post hoc test here. However, I do want to make the note that um, the different choices needs to be based on one of the um, criteria it needs to be based on is whether or not the assumption of homogeneity of variance has been met. There's specific tests for, for post hoc tests for when it's not been met and for when it has been met. And statistical software packages such as SPSS have these different analyses built in so you can actually choose which one you want based on your data. Now, why in the world would you not just go ahead and do post hoc comparisons? Why would you want to plan them before? Well, one of the weaknesses of the post hoc test is the number of comparisons that can be done following the one way ANOVA um, F test. There's actually a simple formula for computing the number of possible comparisons, and I have it here on this slide comparisons equal. The letter K in the formula is the number of groups. So here, for example, if you have four groups, um, four times three divided by two is six. That means you could have six possible comparisons. If you have eight groups, eight times seven divided by two, um, let's say that's 28 comparisons. So clearly the number of possible two group comparisons increases rapidly as the number of groups increase in your study. So herein lies the problem. This is the weakness, the multiple comparisons. Why is it a problem? Well, one of the problems with conducting so many comparisons is that you increase the probability of finding some type of difference, a statistically significant difference, by chance alone. And this is what we refer to as inflating the type 1 error level. Remember that type 1 errors are rejecting the null hypothesis when the null hypothesis is actually true. In other words, a type 1 error is concluding that the evidence suggests that there is a difference when in fact there really is no difference. So oftentimes what, we'll, um, what we do is we set a level of type 1 error when we set the, null high, or when we set the alpha level. Um, this is usually a 0.05. So if the alpha level is set at a 0.05, it means that we will make a type 1 error 5% of the time. That means if we did, let's say, 20 different comparisons, we could expect that one of them would be significantly different by chance alone. And the problem is, is that we really have no idea or no way of knowing which of the significant differences represents a type 1 error. The way that uh, statisticians and um, researchers often deal with this is that they, when they're doing these multiple comparisons, is by setting a more stringent alpha level. And in fact, we already plan to set a more stringent alpha level with planned contrast. So let's take a look at that next. But before we leave this slide, remember, planned contrasts are planned at the beginning of the study, whereas post hoc comparisons are conducted more exploratory after a significant F is found. And the main weakness in post hoc, doing post hoc tests is the multiple comparisons and the inflation of a um, possible type 1 error.
So as I just said, um, when conducting pairwise comparisons, you conduct multiple analyses and thus run the risk of a type 1 error or rejecting the null hypothesis when it's in fact true. And the most common way to minimize this is to use Bonferroni's correction. This is done by dividing the overall significance level of your study by the number of comparisons that you decide to make. So let's take a look at the example um, that we have been looking at with the researcher who wants to examine three groups. If she makes a comparison or planned comparisons between three groups in the study the, and has an overall significance level of a 0 0.05, the Bonferroni corrected significance level for the comparison would be 0 0.05 divided by 3, which would be 0 0.017. If she just planned two comparisons, this would be 0 0.05 divided by 2 here as you can see on the slide, which would make um, the significance level she would use for the planned comparisons a 0 0.025. It's important to note here that this does not change the overall significance level for the onibus F ratio. We're just talking about the planned contrast here. Now, if the comparisons are planned in advance, that is, the um, researcher plans to do planned contrast, then they usually use um, the home sequential bone Ferroni method or approach. And as I just said, as a reminder, to do this method, you simply take the number of comparison tests um, and the significance level, and you divide the significance level by that number. And again, this, re this is the significance level that you use um, to analyze or evaluate the test results. However, as I also just said, remember that a very different procedure is used whenever the comparisons are unplanned. That is, um, whenever you do comparisons after you find a significant onibus um, test. Unplanned um, comparisons can simply use standard post hoc procedures. And as long as a post hoc test are only conducted following a significant ANOVA, that is, they're unplanned, really the home sequential bone Ferroni method is not required. So, what we just discussed is not required. However, in saying that, when multiple um, hypotheses tests are conducted or multiple analyses are done, there's always the concern about committing one or more type 1 errors across tests. So applying one of these three methods listed here is probably a pretty good idea. Um, and let's just go ahead for a moment and again review what um, these three methods are. We've already talked about two of them. We haven't talked about um, the LSD method though. The LSD method for um, control of type 1 error for pairwise comparison should be done when you have three groups. Um, in fact, the LSD method is, a pro, um, appropriate proce is the appropriate procedure um, and requires no adjustment to the significance level provided that you only have three groups involved. However, the bone Ferroni method and the Holmes sequential bone Ferroni method control for type 1 error for all pairwise comparisons. Um, and just as a reminder that both of these procedures require the significance level for the pairwise test be reduced um, after, the onibus, um, after the onibus test is done. So again, the significance level divided by the number of groups. So this ends our discussion on part on the two parts of the one-way ANOVA procedure, the F ratio and the pairwise comparison. So now let's focus on effect size.
So once the one-way ANOVA procedure is done, um, let's say insignificance is found, effect size needs to be computed. In comparison to a t-test where we looked at the differences between means, the effect size estimate for the one-way ANOVA looks at the proportion of the total variance accounted for by the between groups variance, or the variance that's due to the grouping variable, um, the difference in the treatment. Here we call this value r squared, or eta squared, um, and it's calculated, as you can see here in this um, formula on this slide. Once this r squared or eta squared is used, and actually in most research studies what you'll see is eta squared, <clears throat> um, Cohen's conventions can be used to interpret the effect size. Now you'll notice that these are a little different um, than what we looked at for interpreting Cohen's D. A small effect size um, is around a 0 0.01, 0 0.06 is a medium or moderate effect size, and 0.14 is a large effect size. Now that we understand the one-way ANOVA and how to calculate the effect size and interpret it for a one-way ANOVA, let's talk about writing an APA results section. When you write an APA results section for a one-way ANOVA, these are the items that need to be included in that results section. The assumption testing, the descriptive statistics, the number of overall participants, the number of participants per groups, the degrees of freedom, the F ratio, the significance level, the pairwise comparison results, as well as the effect size and power. And here you can see the process for communicating um, specific aspects of your results in APA style. First of all, stating the statistical results of the Onibus test. Here you can see that the F ratio is reported. Actually, it's the F ratio, um, the degrees of freedom, both the within and between groups degrees of freedom, and then the F ratio, which is 7.49. And since that's 7.49, based on what we learned, what we can probably conclude is we're going to have a significant difference between our groups because it's 7.49 um, is pretty far from 1. Based on the alpha reported here, we can see that the alpha is less than 0 .001, and so since that's less than 0 .05, we can say that the results were significant. And finally, you'll see here that the effect size is 0 0.22. Now, you need to state these, these results um, in statistical form, and then write about them. Tell the, the uh, reader what they actually mean. So state the results in sentence form. And this is both for the Onibus test as well as the post hoc or pairwise comparison test that you used. Here you can see is an example of a written APA results section. So the ANOVA was significant, or the one-way ANOVA was significant um, based on these statistical results. Consequently, there's a significant evidence to conclude that there was a difference between course points by the, the communication system used in the course. And a 0 .22 effect size, or eta squared, is a large effect size. Now, post hoc comparisons help us evaluate the differences among the different means, or between the different groups. And here, based on the data, the researcher decided to use Tukey's um, HSD test um, since equal variance was tenable. And what these tests revealed was, was that there was a pairwise comparison difference between the video conferencing and the discussion board group. Um, maybe there wasn't, and there was a significant, um, and there potentially was significant difference in other areas. I will note here, it's also important to look at the mean scores to determine which group scored higher than the other group, so you can talk about that also. So. Um, what you may do here is you could re actually report the means and the standard deviation and say that the video conferencing group scored higher in their course points than the discussion board group. Then finally, it's important when writing an APA results section to state a decision about the null hypothesis. Since the alpha level was less than 0 0.05, the researcher here could say that they had evidence to reject the null hypothesis. Finally, as we are getting ready to end our discussion about the one-way ANOVA, here's an example of what an SPSS data file will look like when it's set up properly for a one-way ANOVA. Here you can see that the, there are scores or course points for the participants in the right-hand row. 
in the left hand row you can see the label um, you can see a label of one two or three for each of the groups so the independent variables labeled as one two and three so for example let's say one is the discussion board group two is the video group and three is the audio group and what you will actually do is go ahead and label those when you go to variable view in you in your SPSS data sets and these la um, these so these labels will show up on your output and it really makes it easier to interpret your results especially for those pairwise comparisons so when you go into SPSS this is what a data set looks like for a one-way ANOVA this now concludes our discussion about a one-way ANOVA and based on our discussion you should now understand the definition for a one-way ANOVA what's needed for a one-way ANOVA, a research scenario or research scenarios um, when a one-way ANOVA can be used. You should also understand how to calculate a one-way ANOVA, starting with the assumption testing and then calculating the actual one-way ANOVA procedure, both the F-ratio and the pairwise comparisons. You should understand that eta squared is used as the effect size and how to calculate eta squared. And then finally, how to communicate um, the results of a one-way ANOVA in APA style as well as set up a data set in SPSS for a one-way ANOVA.